Hello, everyone. This is Inside the Americas. Here's what's coming up in today's show. We'll first take a look at Saudi Arabia's complicated ties with the U.S. following the disappearance of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Then the midterms in the U.S. are just three weeks away. We will head to one of the most reliably democratic districts of the 20th century, where Democrats are now just barely hanging on. And Canada becomes the biggest country in the world to legally sell marijuana for both medicinal and recreational purposes. I'm Jeannie Godula. First up, our picture of the week. This is U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Saudi Arabia. Pompeo was in Riyadh this week to try and get some straight answers as to just what happened to missing Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The Washington Post contributor went into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul two weeks ago and has not been seen since. And as Donald Trump is standing by his ally, the case is now shining a light on U.S.-Saudi business ties, not least between the kingdom and Donald Trump himself. Nick Rushworth explains. In terms of dollars, $3 billion. A military business deal sent to stage in the White House back in March with President Donald Trump bringing a smile to the face of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. We are the oldest ally. Close ties were clear when Trump made his first overseas visit to Riyadh in May 2017. However, those ties are threatened in light of the Jamal Khashoggi affair. In Congress, some senators have invoked the Magnitsky Human Rights Act, which could be used to trigger sanctions against senior Saudi royals. Donald Trump has said he will not backtrack on deals over the writer's disappearance. I don't like the concept of stopping an investment of $110 billion into the United States. Trump also rejects criticism that he has been slow to act because he has a conflict of interest. He tweeted, For the record, I have no financial interests in Saudi Arabia or Russia for that matter. Any suggestion that I have is just more fake news. His ties, though, in the past ran long and deep. Campaigning in 2015, he boasted about just how much money he made from the Saudis. They buy apartments, they spend so much money. Am I going to dislike them? I love them. The problem is, and I say it all the time, their leaders are really smart. They're really cunning. They're really sharp. And we have dummies. Trump's past business ties have included selling a yacht to a Saudi prince in 1991, Saudi investment in Trump's Plaza Hotel in 1995. He sold the 45th floor of Trump World Tower to Saudi Arabia in 2001. And in 2015, he registered eight companies with names tied to Saudi Arabia. I have made On becoming president, of Donald Trump business. shut down those companies and pledged now to pursue no to new foreign deals while in office. Rich again. However, criticism persists with authorities citing payments, for example, by a Saudi lobbying firm as an example of foreign gifts to Trump that could violate the Constitution. Well, that comes as the U.S. is caught up in election fever ahead of the midterms next month. The northern state of Minnesota is home to several key races where Republicans are hoping to take over a Democratic House seat. Case in point, Minnesota's 8th district. Now, it's traditionally been a pro-union Democrat stronghold, but voters there do tend to favor candidates over party politics. And a pro-Trump wave, thanks in large part to his support for mining, could tip the scale for the Republicans. The onset of autumn is bringing temperatures down in Minnesota's 8th district, but the race for a seat in the House of Representatives is heating up. A longtime Democratic bastion, the district favored Donald Trump in the 2016 elections, and Republicans think it's one of their best chances of flipping a House seat in November, with former professional hockey star turned politician Pete Stauber. The 52-year-old father of four previously served as a police commissioner and now runs a hockey equipment store with his brothers. Endorsed by Trump early on, Stauber is making his first foray into national politics. We, we, we talk about the jobs in the economy, keep this pro-growth, pro-jobs agenda going. Here, the local economy relies heavily on the mining and steel industry, a key issue for the once-democratic mayor of Eveleth. 
who, after nearly three decades in office, switched to a pro-Trump Republican ticket in 2016, citing a lack of loyalty from the Democrats. So anti-mining and stuff, they kind of treated us like trash. You know, we're just looking at the candidates. I am with a lot of the people who aligns more with what our economic needs are here. And sometimes you drift from one party to the other in supporting candidates, you know, that's who represents us the best. From miners in the north to small business owners closer to Minneapolis, leaving party politics aside is not uncommon among constituents. Well, Pete Stauber is who I'm going to support. So we have representatives in this area that actually spend time here and know people, and you actually get to know who they are. And I support the ones I like, and I really don't care what party they're in. I like to base my vote upon the individual candidate. I think people are looking for something to help grow business and to grow our economy in our very small rural area. Like the rest of the country, voters here head to the polls on November 6th when Stauber faces off against Democrat Joe Radinovich. A Stauber victory would give a key House seat to Republicans trying to play defense against a potential blue wave sweeping the U.S. Our number of the week now is zero, but it is a good zero for New York City. For the first time in 25 years, NYC had its first ever weekend with zero shootings. Despite that positive news, though, the number of total murders in NYC is on the rise again this year after hitting a record low in 2017. Next to Venezuela, a country that's seen more than 2 million inhabitants leave over the past three years. That's 7% of the population. Political instability, hyperinflation and food shortages are forcing people out in what's been described as one of the worst migration crises in Latin American history. Clement Bonero has the details. The UN calls it a human avalanche. Thousands are leaving Venezuela every day as the country sinks deeper into economic crisis. Over there in Venezuela, it feels like we are all dying slowly. Wages are so low, you can't even afford to buy soap, so you don't wash. You can't buy anything. Even if you have two, three or four jobs, it's never enough. Political instability, hyperinflation and food shortages have forced nearly two million Venezuelans to flee since 2015. That's seven percent of Venezuela's total population. One million have entered neighboring Colombia, seeking a better life for themselves and their children. I come here because school supplies and shoes are extremely expensive in Venezuela. So I come to Colombia to sell coffee and cigars to make a bit of money and give my children what they need. Colombia has borne the brunt of the exodus, but all neighboring countries have received migrants from Venezuela. According to UN figures, more than 500,000 people have entered Ecuador this year alone, and asylum applications have tripled in Peru. Coping with the influx has been a major challenge for countries in the region. The UN says international help is urgently needed, describing the situation as one of the worst migration crises in Latin America's history. Colombia and other countries have been using their own money to deal with this human avalanche from Venezuela. But it's no longer possible. We need humanitarian aid as quickly as possible. The U.S. has already given 40 million euros and the EU has announced a 35 million euro aid package to help countries in the region deal with the flow of migrants. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, meanwhile, has refused to acknowledge the crisis, accusing Colombia and the U.S. of plotting against him. Stores in Canada now have a new product to sell on their shelves, pot. This week, Canada became just the second country in the world after Uruguay to legally sell recreational marijuana. That move to sell cannabis for more than medicinal purposes was a key campaign pledge of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Displayed on store shelves and ready to live its first day in the legal market. Cannabis is now authorised in Canada, which becomes the largest country in the world to legalise marijuana for recreational use. Here in the province of Quebec, 
Users will be allowed to own up to 150 grams. Needless to say that in Canada, I think it's a day that can be considered historic. It's a great first. The first country in the G7 to legalize coast-to-coast non-medical cannabis and the second country in the world after Uruguay. Despite being made legal, each province will be able to interpret the rules their own way and set certain limits, such as legal age to buy and how much you can carry. The new policy is aimed at curbing the revenue of the cannabis black market, which is estimated at six billion Canadian dollars. But it also has raised concerns around public health and safety. I think I can answer as a doctor and as a father. I do not agree with the legalization of recreational cannabis. It's like legalizing alcohol or tobacco. The Cannabis Act fulfills a 2015 campaign pledge made by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It lifts a 95-year prohibition on the substance and makes Canada only the second nation after Uruguay to fully legalize the drug. We'll leave you now with this. Donald Trump's interview on 60 Minutes got a lot of internet traffic this week, but it wasn't about the content. Twitter users went nuts over a painting seen in the background at the White House. It shows Trump sitting at a table with other former Republican presidents, including Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, and Richard Nixon. Now, Twitter was quick to compare the painting to an infamous work of a bunch of dogs playing poker. And one user brought up this picture of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton having a laugh at the president's expense. The painting is called The Republican Club. It's by Missouri artist Andy Thomas, who's already sold countless prints of the work online. And the artist confirmed it in the picture. Donald Trump is drinking a Diet Coke. That's all the time we have for this show. Thanks so much for watching Inside the Americas. We'll see you again next week for all the news from north to south. There used to be 10 fishing trawlers at this harbor in the southwest of England, and now there are only two left. British fishermen voted for Brexit because they said the European Union had forced them to share their waters and they wanted to get back control. We've been speaking to fishermen here in North Devon. More than two years after the referendum, they still don't know what's going to happen to them when Britain leaves the European Union. Brexit, a sea of uncertainty. And report us on France24 and France24.com.